broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau, online at scfb.org. And by the Columbia Metropolitan Airport, online at columbiaairport.com. And by Time Warner Cable, online at timewarnercable.com. And welcome back to this week at the State House as the General Assembly continues into its uh, almost completing its sixth week of the new session here. Uh, issues continue to move forward and we thought we would take a look at some issues that will be really affected by the budget, they affect you, the complex issues and how will the General Assembly deal with some of these? How do they deal with the question of aging? the so-called coming gray tsunami, as it's called, the doubling of South Carolina's senior population. Are we ready? What are the challenges? What are the basics? Some of the language that helps you understand uh, uh, what uh, this issue is all about. But first of all, we've got some housekeeping to do, and that is I, I want to thank Time Warner Cable, Columbia Metropolitan Airport, and the Farm Bureau for sponsoring the program. Also, ETV for producing the program and the South Carolina Press Association for assisting us in putting the programs together. We really appreciate it. And of course, I want to, our friends at 518 in the Block Building, the house is off this week, but I'm sure they're gathered around there and I hope they get some real benefit out of what we've got for them today because we're going to deal with, try to take complex issues and simplify them. Complex issues, that's what they are. And I've got two guests today. Uh, right here, I don't know whether to call you Colonel or <laughs> Miss or what, but Dale Watson. Uh, she is our state long-term care ombudsman. What's an ombudsman? What are they going to do? We're going to get in that and find out. Mr. Tony Kester has been on this show before. Yes, sir. So some of you may know him. He is head, he's director of the Office of Aging. These two interplay. They deal with, could be your loved ones, could be you. So nobody's figured out how to stop the time clock. With that, let's go while well, we got the time and talk first with ombudsman. What is an ombudsman? An ombudsman are a group of people who advocate for residents in long-term care facilities. We act as the voice of the resident. We act on behalf of the resident and we help them to resolve their complaints. Facility, what do you mean by facility so that the viewer out there, you act for the residents in the facility, what, what are you speaking of? There are multiple facilities in the state of South Carolina. Uh, what we go into are the nursing homes, the residential care or assisted living facilities, we go into the psychiatric facilities, uh, disabilities and special needs, Department of Mental Health. If it's a long-term care facility, even a rehab facility, if it's a long-term care facility, then we act on behalf of the residents in there. So these are people that are challenged. They can be challenged through age. They can be challenged through disability. They're there. And you become, I guess, it's, is this fair to say, you become their eyes and their mouth? Right. We, we are the voice of the resident. We act on their behalf and we try to resolve their complaints. We, are, we work totally for them. So if, if somebody out there has a complaint and they're in a facility, how, how would they get a hold of you? Well, we are in the facilities. We go in and we visit the residents and we also have posters by law. Posters have to be posted in a prominent place. We do presentations in the community. We have brochures, of course our website, and we just try to get out there and make our presence known to the persons in the facility and their family members. How many of y'all are there? There are 21. 21 of you. And how many facilities with 21 people are y'all trying to cover? There are uh, 197 nursing homes, 
477 residential or assisted living facilities and roughly about 1,600 um, DDSN or disabilities and special needs facilities. So you're trying to cover all of those facilities with those few people? Yes, sir. That's got to be a challenge. Yes, sir, it is. But we do the best we can with the resources that we have uh, available to us. And y'all are located where here in Columbia? We're here in the in the Lieutenant Governor's Office on Aging. All right. Well, then let's go to Mrs. Kester and find out about that. Ms. Kester, tell me about uh, uh, their program. But why is it in the Office of Aging, and how does it relate to the Office on Aging? Well, the Ombudsman Program is a very interesting program. It is created in legislation in the Old Americans Act, which also creates the state unit on aging, which is the program designed to administer the funds. So the legislation creates the Ombudsman's Office. It creates a state unit on aging. But the Ombudsman Program has unique laws and directives built in to give them independence. They've got to be housed in an agency or in a location that has no regulatory authority over long-term care facilities. It would be a conflict if they were investigating themselves. So because we have no regulatory authority and because we receive the funding for the Ombudsman Program, it's a good fit. But it's important that we're able to communicate regularly to know what's going on in the Ombudsman's world to me for a limited amount of information because I'm not an Ombudsman. So they're housed in our office, but I'm not an Ombudsman. I've not been trained. I've not been certified. The Ombudsman have protections under the federal program that gives them the freedom to go into facilities, look at the health records because they are representing the resident. So they see what the resident sees. They're an advocate for the uh, resident. And so it is a good fit. And I think we work well together. And um, that is how the Ombudsman program is in the, the Lieutenant Governor's office. So are you telling me, so the viewers will understand, are you saying that the Ombudsman, though housed in your program, is not directly under y'all's direction. In other words, you don't tell them where to go or should they go. They're housed there. You provide administrative support, but they are semi-independent to represent the folks out there. And that is correct. And the first thing that I did was read the legislation to get an understanding of what the responsibilities are. In many states, there is a direct conflict and it is self-imposed because the state unit director does not understand the mandates of the program. And sometimes these mandates will actually conflict with state policy, state regulations. But the federal laws are very clear and they will supersede any state policies. So they reside in our office, but they sit somewhat to the side and they do have a great deal of independence. But the reason it works in our office is because we're just down the hall. We're communicating daily. She informs me that we have issues without getting into the specifics. Many times the ombudsmen are called into court and testify on behalf of the, the resident. So because I'm not certified, I don't have the federal protections that the ombudsman do. So it's not wise for me to have intimate knowledge of specific cases because I do not have those protections. And again, that's why it's important to understand the way the program was created through the federal mandates, what her rights are, what her responsibilities are, which I support, and she understands that she has unique uh, privileges, let's say. But it's important you don't abuse those privileges, and so the fact that we're, we're constantly in contact, we're talking, I know what she's doing, and she's letting me know so that if there is a complaint, because many times the public doesn't understand, the ombudsman is there for the resident. They're not there for the family. The family may not have a right to know if they do not have a legal standing with the resident. And so it creates a conflict. Many times we get complaints from the family. We complained and nobody did anything. It was investigated, but the family legally has no right to that information. So they're assured it was looked into 
But the ombudsman want to do what's best for the resident, which may be different than the wishes of the family. And again, this is a unique um, program that you have to understand it. And so again, the first thing you do is read the laws so that you do understand where the challenges are. Well, let me ask you this question because I, I asked it of our ombudsman. The contact office on aging, how did they get a hold of the ombudsman? Do you have websites and we have a website. that allow them to access into the ombudsman? We do. We have a website, but we also have a receptionist because many times the, the seniors or their families do not have computers. We have that generation who was not raised and did not work with computers. They can call our office. We also have regional ombudsmen uh, in our area agencies that they can call. We have material that we hand out at health fairs, um, events where we sponsor a table. We do really as much as we can to get the information out. If you don't know about the program, it's certainly not there to help you. And we want to help everyone that has a question or a concern in a facility. Because many times the complaint may be that the facility is doing something that they're well within their rights. There's an expectation that exceeds the requirements of a facility. So then the ombudsman will explain that the facility is actually compliant, but the expectations may be greater than a facility is, is going to deliver. Ms. Watson, how many complaints do you get a year? We get on average uh, about 8,000 complaints. Last year we got a, a slight bump up. We uh, received more than 8,400 complaints last year. And if I wanted to make a complaint, let's say I was a resident, just simply, how do you file a complaint? They can call us. Um, they can, their family can call us. We are there. We try to be there in the facility as much as possible. They, so they can call us. They can fax us. You know, but we would like to be there as much as possible so we can directly receive the complaints. All right. Um, let me ask you, uh, with that many complaints and the number of people that you have told us that are arms busman, is it enough? We do the best we can with what we have. <laughs> Is it enough? We would like to be much more present, have a better presence in the facility. We have the Friendly Visitor Program where we try to go in and have a better presence with, it, with the residents. And they visit and they receive the complaints and they oftentimes act as the relative to the, um, the, the, the resident because about 60% of the folk have no one to visit. So there's no one to receive the complaint. If, as Tony said, if the complaint is about the facility, then there's no one to take it for them. So a lot of times, if the ombudsman is not there, then the friendly visitor is there to receive the complaint and pass it on to the ombudsman so we can come out, talk with the resident, and we can investigate it. So are there enough? No, sir. But we do the best that we can with what we have, trying to be present in each facility as much as possible. Um, so that they have access to us. All right, and, and, and let me ask you another question. Um, ombudsman, what if a facility is failing or their license is pulled? Are the ombudsman involved in that? Yes, sir. Could you tell our viewers where you come into play if a facility fails, their license they could be closed? What happens to those people? When uh, the license is pulled by DHEC, then the relocation team goes into effect and we generally are either chair or vice chair of that and we go in immediately to the facility. If we know the facility is failing and we have uh, some forewarning, what we will do is go into the facility ahead of time and just start talking to the residents, trying to find out where they want to go and then we start looking around to see if there's a bed available for that resident to go into in the immediate area. Uh, we go in, help the residents pack their clothes. We want to be sure that the resident knows where they're going, knows that the facility is closing because we have been in situations where the facility closed very quickly and the residents didn't know. So we're there to inform the resident what's going on, tell them what their rights are and be sure that their resident rights are, 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 are followed and that they have some say in, in what's going on with them. So we're there, we help them pack, we help them to get to their facilities and we go back and we check on them to be sure that they are um, happy where they are and if they are, 
they move to a facility that they don't like, they don't have any family close, then we work with them to help them get to another place if there is a bed available. So that our viewers understand, these again are people, they may be challenged by age, mobility, uh, early dementia, all sorts of things. They have nowhere else to go. I want to explain to them how traumatic it is. Didn't y'all close the facility? And sadly, and it, and it helped us, and I want the people to know the great story that came out of this, but didn't these folks end up having their personal belongings and stuff put into garbage bags because that was the only thing available? Yes, sir. Could you yes, tell sir. our viewers just how traumatic this thing is, how they get yeah. swept up and their stuff put in garbage bags and how the failure of the system results in them losing everything that remaining they have? There was a facility that closed and they, the, the license was pulled and the residents had to move very, very quickly and generally they don't have any suitcases or anything and the residents belongings were placed in black trash bags and one lady in particular and that I that this will always stay with me um, her belongings were placed in a big black trash bag and so you have all of this the, their belongings out there on the floor and she was moving to another facility and they moved her bag and the rest of the residents things. When she got to the next facility, they thought it was trash because it was in a big trash bag. The tragic thing about that is that this lady was old, she had no family, and all she had were her pictures and her albums of her family. And so picture your whole life in a trash bag and they've reduced your life down to a trash bag, a black trash bag. There is no dignity in that. And then on top of it, they threw it in the garbage because the staff came along and they just assumed that this black trash bag was garbage. And so your life has been reduced to garbage and so she had nothing. She had no remnants of her life. She had no pictures. She had no clothes. Just wiped out. Just wiped out. And a move. And a move. That story and what happened got back to uh, Debbie Hammond, who's chief of staff here at the um, lieutenant governor's office. And we were able to get together with a nonprofit that's providing 50 bags a year that includes a black duffel bag, the basic elements. And I want you to tell our viewers what it means just to have a plastic cup in that bag along with toiletries because their money didn't go follow them. No, sir. And could you tell our viewers what those bags have meant because we've used them now to preserve the dignity and the, the few things that these people have in these moves when these facilities close. It's, it has been a godsend. It's been a blessing. It really has been. When facilities close, the residents can put, can pack their bags, pack whatever belongings they have, and roll things out with dignity. Uh, we have seen the, the pieces in there. They have toiletries, they have jackets, they have a cup. And a why cup, a cu well, why a is cup, a cup to you so? <laughs> a cup was so special to me because we went into a facility and the residents were all drinking out of an igloo cooler with one cup. And we were just amazed, just, just the sanitation of that. And so residents, when they move, have their own personal cup. And it may not seem much to everyday people, but to have your own things, things that belong to you. And even one resident, when, when uh, Debbie gave us the bags and we took them to the residents who were relocating and they were looking and then they said, we, our own underwear? And I said, well, yes, sir. And that does, may sound a little shocking, but it, we, they were just amazed. And he, one gentleman said, I get a chance to keep this, this jacket. And I said, yes, sir. He said, I can take it out of the plastic. And I said, yes, sir, it's your jacket. You can put it on. People have, have thought about you. They have not forgotten you. And so, and he just said, thank them for me. And that's something, and to our viewers, I want to know from the Lieutenant Governor's office, we'd love to say who they are. They're, really a non-profit association they, they, with a group of ladies um, that are involved in this and, and, and we can't thank them enough. 
Uh, let me quickly move on because we're going to run out of time and I want, there's so many things I wanted to cover very quickly. Mr. Kess, what is home and community based? Home and community based services is a, it's a collection of services and if you step back and consider that our, our goal is to allow people to remain in their home with family, with those things that they have become accustomed to. They, they don't want to go to an institution. So we look for ways to provide supports that will allow them to do that. And it may be if we bring them a meal every day, that would be a home and community-based service. If we help transport them to the doctor, to the pharmacy, if they need to go to the store to get food, uh, that would be a home and community based service. If they're able to get out of the house, which we encourage into a group setting, they can go to a senior center, they can go to a meal site, and there they can talk to other seniors because many times our seniors live alone and they don't have family. So if we can transport them to a group setting where they get a chance to talk to people and just have that, that interaction with someone, they're they've experienced similar things in life. They have a lot in common. We also want to challenge them mentally because we know if you don't use your mind or your body, you're gonna lose it. So we want them to be active. We want to be mentally engaged. We also want to provide that meal for them. But we try to provide about four hours out of the day where they can be with other seniors, have opportunities they wouldn't have if they were home alone. And we know that that's much healthier, and we want them to remain mentally and physically healthy. So those services that we're providing, another example may be a wheelchair ramp. If we have a wife uh, who's caring for a husband and the husband's in the wheelchair, she can't get him out of the house. She can't get him to the doctor herself. It may be as simple as building a wheelchair ramp. She can get him out of the house and she gives him mobility. Now his world opened up. So if that's all they need, it's a service that we can provide that is gonna meet a need that will allow someone to stay where they want to be, which is in their home. So let me ask you, because we're quickly running out of time with so much to talk about today. Um, the program that you're talking about, home and community-based services, with all the debate going on about should we or shouldn't we take the Medicaid money, Medicaid and everything else, is it an accurate summation that the programs at the Office on Aging attempt to keep people in their home and slow down the migration to the Medicaid beds and keep them independent, we aging are, in place? We are trying to keep them at home and because we're not Medicaid, we do not administer the Medicaid funds. We try to keep people independent. We and want off of Medicaid. And we want to keep them off of Medicaid because the services that we provide, we average spending about $1,400 a year for a resident. If they and, were in a Medicaid bay, what would it be? Um, it would be in excess of $50,000 to so the state. So almost a $50,000 savings. We, we're getting closer and closer on the time very quickly. I, I want to head to a couple of other things um, uh, very quickly uh, in, in regard to all of this. Um, there's been a lot of debate recently about regula regulations, the regulatory environment. We're all out there. We're at ground level going into the nursing homes and things and seeing. Um, Ms. Watson, I'll start with you. From our perspective, what are we looking for in regulations and what do you find frustrating about the regulatory environment in South Carolina? We always want to be sure that the regulations make sense, uh, that they're there to protect the resident, the quality of life and quality of care. That's what I look for uh, because they should be there to, to, to for, as protections for them. So uh, again, always... So we welcome, we welcome regulations. Right. We want them to maintain standards. We want them to protect patients right. and, and residents and all that have said. Now, do you come into incidents where common sense just goes flying out of the window? Sometimes we have, <laughs> sometimes we have, and, and, and then we have to, to call and say, why is this here? Why is this here? Can this be changed? Because if it doesn't benefit ultimately the care for the resident, then you have to ask yourself, why was this written? Well, we, we encountered, and I'll ask both of you, you were there. We encountered one facility, they just licensed one or two years ago, 
proved the locking system, came back a year later and told them the locks were not adequate, and they had to put up signs to tell the Alzheimer's patients how to get out. And isn't it your experience that Alzheimer's patients still maintain their cognitive skills of reading and understanding in that regard? No, they lose it over time. Over and time, over but time. initially in the early yeah. phases of it. Yes, sir. So they could read those signs. You're telling them how to get out. How to get out of the facility? Yes. Well, it depends on how weak they are. <laughs> they, they, may, they are disabled. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But they're also mobile. Yeah, they, my but they are very mobile. And yes, I know sir. in the early stages they can read, understand, and get out. In this facility, the regulators made them come in. They had electric locks that worked, and if the power went off, it unlocked. They made them put a padlock on a gate that would yeah. corral them in against the burning, uh, and then told the facility, well, to get a hammer to give them to break the padlock. Don't y'all find it frustrating when, when that kind of stuff goes on instead of them worrying about how long they've been in a bed, are they getting the right medical attention or something? I think if you're going to write the regulations, then you should experience the facilities to see how these regulations become practical applications or are they very impractical? You know, I think the regulations should address health and safety for the residents. We saw a covered entrance to a facility that is outside, but it had a sprinkler system. So in the sprinkler, on the outside of the building, but we know the water falls down and the fire burns up. So I'm not sure how effective a sprinkler is going to be if you're sprinkling the concrete in the drive, but the wood and structure above the sprinklers is in fact what's burning. But I think if the ones who write the regulations go and look at how their regulations are forcing facilities to spend money, and I'll say needlessly in this example, that's money that could be put into the care of the residents and not into meeting a mandate from, uh, from someone here in Columbia that may or may not have even been to a facility to, to see how practical these regulations are once they're implemented. How about a can of hairspray? I understand what facility got written up for can of hairspray. We couldn't understand that when we were at that facility. <laughs> we sure couldn't. We sure couldn't. couldn't. That one. We got one minute. I'm going to give you a stab at this. OSS facilities, what are they to our viewers? Very quickly, if you could. I know it's a challenge. Uh, optional state supplement is a, the, an amount of money that the state provides to residents who receive uh, supplemental Social Security income. And they help the residents to pay for boarding care at, at uh, residential care facilities. Without that money, the resident could not stay there. They couldn't afford to stay they there. Would they have anywhere else to go? No, sir. They, they so not. if we lose them, those people are going to end up out on the street, aren't they? Yes, sir. And some of these people used to be in long, like mental health facilities and things. Yes, sir. So it really is a safety net for these people, it, isn't it? It is definitely a safety net because you're going to pay for them one way or the other. And our safety net that we won't go on and on is we're out of time. So with that, we thank you for tuning in. We'll be back to discuss other issues here at the State House. Broadcast of this program is made possible in part by the South Carolina Farm Bureau online at scfb.org and by the Columbia Metropolitan Airport online at columbiaairport.com and by Time Warner Cable online at timewarnercable.com